Well, good evening, and welcome to the fifth annual New York City Rocket Pitch for Babson College. We are all thrilled to have you here. My name is Jim Burnham on behalf of the New York City chapter of the alumni. Club. We uh, certainly welcome you. Uh, I am the president of the local chapter, and so I get the lucky honor, I guess, to stand up here and address you uh, briefly before we kick off. Although, uh, any of you that are unaware of it, I'm going to make it very clear, this event would not happen without Robert Talley. He certainly has listed a lot of other alumni and members of the executive committee here in New York City to help, but he is by far the one that steers this and makes it happen. So we certainly appreciate all of Robert's hard work and dedication. For those of you that have never been to this event, it is going to be a very fun-filled, uh, but very exciting and fast-paced event. Uh, Dean Hanno is going to address us in a, just a few moments to give you the whole layout, so I'm not going to spoil that thunder, but it is like a rocket pitch. Uh, it will go very, very fast, uh, but again, it should be very, uh, should be very fun and, and very amusing. We are very fortunate this evening to have uh, Janet, who is the executive director of the Blank Center, with us tonight. And so, with no further ado, I'm going to pass it off to her. Janet, come on up. tonight, I want to give a uh, congratulations to the New York City chapter for conceiving of this event many years ago. I remember being on some uh, conference calls with Bob Talley in late 2009, very early 2010. Um, the first event was in 2010, and now here it is, the fifth annual New York City Rocket Pitch. Just a brief bit of history. The rocket pitch event started at Babson in the year 2000, and so uh, it continues every year in the fall. But this is the spring version in uh, another location, and it's very, very exciting. Uh, just briefly, uh, for those of you who haven't been on campus in the last several years, the Blank Center focuses on accelerating the practice of entrepreneurship. And we've launched two, uh, one program and one event that uh, really signify how Babson approaches uh, entrepreneurship these days in terms of uh, rewarding uh, action taken and milestones achieved. Our approach to entrepreneurship is take small, smart, smart steps, so act, learn from those steps, and build and revise. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, we launched a program four years ago called the John E. and Alice L. Butler Venture Accelerator Program. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that a year after starting it, we piloted uh, with a small group of alums, and then we have opened it up to a alum. So last year, we worked with 60 alumni entrepreneurs to help them move their businesses forward in the pursuit and the launch of program. There are some of these brochures out on the registration table. Feel free to pick up one as, as you need. And many of you may remember the traditional business plan competition that Babson was one of the first, was the first to start at the undergraduate level and then started it at the MBA level a few years later. Well, in 2012, we totally turned that thinking upside down. Uh, eliminated the business plan competition and launched the Beta Challenge competition. Beta standing for Babson Entrepreneurial Thought and Action. And yes, we had the, uh, kept up the tradition of having the undergrad track and the MBA track. A year ago, we were able to partner with our friends in uh, the uh, alumni network, and Carol Hacker, Vice President of the organization is here tonight, and we launched the alumni track. So last year uh, was the first time that alumni could compete for a cash prize at Babson College, and the grand prize at each level was $20,000. So in two weeks, two weeks from this afternoon, we have our uh, 2014 Beta Challenge, and we will have um, nine student and alum entrepreneurs competing for a grand total of $75,000. Keep that in mind, uh, if you're an 
alum and you want to make a submission next year, you need to be ready in early February to submit your material. And so I want to give a shout out tonight um, to a strong supporter of what we do at Babson. And we are, are fortunate tonight to have the gold sponsor of our Beta Challenge competition here in the audience. That's Stuart Goldstein. Stuart and his firm, um, Samuel Goldstein, is the gold sponsor. And they also have been working as accountants and advisors to several uh, Babson alumni businesses. And they are generously offering up to $1,500 of in-kind services and discounted accounting services for the next year to each of the pitchers tonight. So Stuart, thank you very much for supporting that. <laughs> My pleasure now to turn the podium over to Dennis Hanna, who is going to uh, moderate, facilitate this uh, event tonight. Thank you, Janet. So let me just, uh, a couple remarks before we begin. First of all, I, th I think this is a great uh, time to remind people of Babson's mission, what we uh, really try to achieve in the world. And our mission is to create leaders, uh, prepare leaders to create great economic and social value everywhere. And I think uh, it's so exciting to be able to come down from Wellesley and to see all of the economic and social value being created on the campus there. And you heard Janet talk about some of the amazing things that are happening even as we speak. And next week with the Beta Challenge is always a highlight of the year. And then to come down here, and we're going to hear some presentations from some amazing folks uh, who are also trying to create great economic and social value with the uh, ideas that you're going to hear in a few minutes. And it, this is my fourth year in a row when I've done the moderation for this. And every year, the week before I'm here, I'm always off in some other part of the world trying to do the same thing uh, with a very different population. So I just came back on Sunday from Tanzania. And we held a rocket pitch competition. Well, we actually did a whole week-long training seminar for high school students in Tanzania. And at the end of that, on Friday, we had uh, a rocket pitch competition. All 120 students participated. Uh, at the end of the rocket pitch competition, a young woman, 13 years old, uh, stood up. Uh, she, and, and this is a culture, mind you, where English is probably the third language for this young woman. She's 13 years old. She's an orphan. She'd never even had heard the concept of a rocket pitch before. And within five days, she stood up in front of an audience of about 150 people from her community and pitched the idea about a unique vegetable, uh, vegetable garden she was going to create in her home. And uh, the crowd uh, you know, just broke out into uh, applause, and, and everybody went wild and crazy because she did such an amazing job. Uh, and also, I should mention, this is a culture, by the way, where the typical role of women is to sit in the back and not say anything. Uh, by the end of the week, she was up in front of the room, 13 years old, pitching to an audience of people like you, uh, and, and won that rocket pitch competition. So it's great to see that mission being fulfilled by creating great economic and social value wherever Babson sets foot. Uh, and that's what we're going to see tonight when we hear these amazing ideas from our rocket pitch presenters. Before we get started, I think it's, uh, we should introduce some of the folks in the room who are going to help out with the feedback and the evaluation. You know, first of all, I'm going to start off with the review board, which uh, you're going to meet the judges in a second or the, the panelists. The review board, just to remind uh, people of their roles, uh, at the end of all the presentations, the review board gets first crack at questions of our rocket pitchers, but during the actual rocket pitch presentations, it'll only be our panelists up front who get, get a chance to ask questions. So on our review board, you've already heard about Stuart Goldstein. Stuart, where's Stuart? Where do you go? Way in the back. You should be up here. How are you going to be able to see them? You know? uh, and thank you for all your support for this event as well. I know you are played a big part and uh, will play a big part working with these businesses. And then uh, Babson's own newest trustee and uh, Mr. Entrepreneurship on campus, Len Green, right here. Let me hear more applause. Come on. 
None of your students are here right now, right? right. It's just your former students. They don't have to suck up to you anymore. Uh, then we've got Anthony Pergola. Anthony, right here. Thank you for being on the show. Kathleen Nusek. Kathleen. Kathleen here. Maybe not able to make it tonight. Uh, Henry Kassendorf. Henry, thank you very much. Yep. And our you know, youngest, but probably, you know, most skilled um, panelist, review board, uh, Michael Peggs. So, Michael Peggs. <laughs> and then we got three great uh, panelists up front here who are going to, um, you know, have first crack at questions of our rocket pitchers. Uh, first of all, we've got, uh, right here in front of me, In Ingrid Vandervelt from Dell. Thank you for joining us again. <laughs> And uh, actually, this guy hasn't even graduated, so I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Mike Caslin, who's just finishing up the, uh, the MBA program, will give me a great pleasure to, yeah, to hand you that diploma. Can we have that right up? So, parent 07 is Kit beat him by seven years. You know, so, but master's going to Mike Caslin. And last but not least, Mark Watkins. So thank you very much, Mark, for joining us. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chandler. This is my co-founder, Cassandra, and we are City Pretzel. City Pretzel is a Manhattan-based food research and development group. We take local talent, suppliers, and ingredients and use them to reimagine classic food products. We target uh, food categories that are experiencing flat, or anemic sales, these categories are often dominated by large, slow-moving players, and we believe they are ripe for disruption. Our first product, Whiskey Pretzel, is targeting pretzel, the pretzel category, a $700 million category nationwide, 20 million here in New York City, growing at a paltry half percent measured by dollar sales. Again, we are targeting with Whiskey Plus Pretzel, our first product. It's a, it's a dynamic juxtaposition of whiskey distilled right here in New York City with a blend of sugar and spices all across a crisp, crunchy, pretzel backbone. Now the cool thing about this product is how dynamic it is. We can exchange the whiskey we use in our recipe with another whiskey, and it's going to change the way the pretzel tastes. We can take that whiskey, change it with the bourbon, going to change the way the pretzel tastes. If you like beer, we can throw a beer in. It's great that hot, uh, the hot backbone, that, uh, that malty backbone as well. It's a really cool product, and we're very excited to see what we can do with it. I'm going to turn your to Cassandra, and she's going to tell you a little bit about where we are going. So for the past two months since the inception of Whiskey Plus Pretzel, we have been talking with our suppliers and figuring out our distribution channels, as well as talking to our customers. Currently, we're building or we're baking these pretzels in our apartment, and we both have our food licenses, but we want to get in with an incubator so that we get access to investors and distribution channels, as well as being able to sell our product on the commercial level. Um, Actually, our current distribution method is handing them out for free to local bars and happy hours. And the response that we've gotten is, when can we buy these? The answer is April 26, 2014, which is none other than National Pretzel Day. <laughs> yep, we're holding our launch party at Earl's Beer and Cheese on 97th and Park. So stop by when the samples we give you after aren't enough, because they won't be. We would love to see you there. Currently, we're asking for $10,000 to start our big first batch, which would be a 2,000 pound batch. Most of it will go to ingredients, our raw material costs, as well as our incubator space and storage, packaging, and delivery. So if you guys can't get enough of these pretzels, come see us after the event. We'll also have our financial uh, statements as well. So thank you very much. And, uh, and there's a trick here, they can't talk because <laughs> I've actually never uh, looked at a pretzel deal before, so thank you very much for that. Um, what do you get for $10,000? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a tech entrepreneur, so I'm just really curious, what do you expect to actually generate from a revenue and a profitability standpoint over what period of time? So our first batch is 2,000 pounds, and about... 7,000 would go into all of the ingredients, including package, uh, packaging, shipping, and... I'm sorry, what percentage of the company for $10,000? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
Well, we're kind of open right now. We're open to equity. We're open open to stockholders. We're open to you know a loan or a percentage of sales. Um, our projection, if like for a year, would be three hundred thousand. So that's it's it would depend on on the person who's looking to invest. We're open. Okay. Question. Do you, um, can you talk about, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you've got a little bit about your background. I don't know if either of you have experience in the, in, the, in the food business, or if not, if they're advisors or people that do. Uh, um, yeah, I, I love to cook. Um, I've taken a couple cooking classes. Um, my father actually started an ice cream company, so he is one of our advisors. Our other advisor is the owner of Earl's Beer and Cheese, as well as his three other locations. Um, so he, you know, has has um, experience in, in the retail side of food as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, one, you know, wonderfully creative. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, who, who's your who's your real customer? Is it the tavern owner or is it the, the user? You know, how do you think about that? And uh, maybe the, the, the various users that would go after this. So it's it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that it's a great substitute for bar peanuts. So I think that you know the way that we've been approaching it is you hand it out to hand it out for free to the customers, and then you would have you know the bags behind the bar, so that people buy them, and the bar would also get you know a percentage of, of the sales. But I think that you know it's something that we want to have in stores as well as bars. So we got time for one more quick question. I'm just curious, again, I, I, this is new for me, so thank you very much for answering the questions. Uh, so I'm wondering if, because I've never seen pretzels actually take off before, kind of like cupcakes did, and I'm wondering if this, if you're seeing like an emerging trends, sort of like the cupcake movement with Magnolia cupcakes here in town, and you're, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question. So there is a company called Pretzel Crisp. They're actually founded by the same couple that started uh, the Bagel Crisp company. Uh, started back in 2004, and they actually just sold the company for 350 million in uh, 2012. So again, we go after fruit categories with flat sales. We believe that uh, customers are wanting something more than just their standard pretzel, which is everywhere. Thank you. So next up, we are going to hear from Shannon Smith with Cumulative. So let's make sure we're all set. All yours, Shannon. Great. Hi, my name is Shannon Smith. I am the founder of Cumulative. Before founding the company, I was the senior vice president at Red Eye International, a behavioral data and retargeting company. This doesn't go against my time. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Uh, estimated e-commerce sales in 2017 are going to be $440 billion. E-commerce sales from tablets alone, not including smartphones, is projected to be $80 billion. Average e-commerce conversion rates on PCs, desktops, and laptops is 2.63%. The average conversion rate on a tablet, someone shopping on a tablet, is only 2.18%. This represents what we're calling a tablet conversion gap of $17.6 billion. Cumulative increases iPad e-commerce conversion rates. So here was a, a client of mine at Red Eye, and, and I've been talking to him. It was a small company, $6 million in total sales, golf retail, a very, very tight margin business. Some of their best customers are shopping on an iPad, higher average order value. But the conversion rates are much, much lower. So even for a small company like this, and only does $6 million in sales, this tablet conversion gap represents a quarter million dollars in lost sales. We display special offers and promotions at critical moments during the purchasing process to encourage shoppers to complete the purchase. So how do we do it? We have a proprietary tracking code that monitors visitors' behavior while they shop the website from their iPad. We track shopper intent, both per positive purchase intent and potential negative exit intent to serve the best promotions at the right time to encourage shoppers to complete the purchase. So here's an example. You know, people aren't really designing mobile sites for, for uh, tablets. They're just using responsive design. So what you see on a desktop or laptop is what you see on your tablet. Somebody comes in, they want to buy golf clubs, they select a club, 
They put it in the shopping cart. If they leave the cart, that could indicate exit intent. We want to serve an offer to try to get them to convert. And we'll bring them to checkout. This is one example of a trigger that we could use. Somebody went into the shopping cart, put something in the cart, and then left the cart. But we can also do new versus returning shoppers, uh, page or product category if they have a, a product that's on sale, geolocation, uh, season day time targeting, traffic source where they're coming from, and device type, maybe Android versus tablet or, or smartphone. Now we've built a very, very simple interface. You can come in there, you can create your overlay, that's your, the pop-up, you can create the trigger. We're going to have any number of triggers as we get moving with this thing. Right now we have about six different triggers that they can pick from, whether it's a new shopper, uh, somebody coming in, putting something in the cart, and they just take the snippet of code, they stick it into the HTML, and it all works from there. Thank you. Questions from our panel? Hey, I have, yeah, I have a two-part question. Okay. Um, first one is, so this is for kind of still web-based as opposed to native apps, is that, is that right? Right now, yes. Yeah. So we, we might develop like SDK and do something with apps. Um, right now, the big problem we're finding is it is the web base. So a lot of people are pushing, like one of my clients, Rula La, La huge, huge company, $300 million in sales. They're pushing their app because they're getting higher conversions in the app. But the app uh, adoption rate is a little bit lower. People are still shopping from the tablet on a website. And so we're just focusing right now on the actual website. Right. And there, do you, there, are, there are a lot of targeting type in prod, products like this on the, yep. you know, for the web. Um, but you feel like those don't, don't um, can't, can't be used in specifically targeted. Um, they could, yeah. but then you get the same problem that you would just uh, any e-commerce solution they have on desktop. You're just taking the desktop, the PC, laptop uh, solution, sticking it on a tablet. We want to focus on tablets. We want to know what drives tablets, why they're converting, why they're not converting, and develop solutions and promotions based on a tablet shopper. Can you walk us through your business model? How, how that sure. Works? So we have a couple of ways, and, and this is from talking to clients and doing interviews with clients. One of the things we're thinking about doing and just to get early adopters is just doing it strictly on a rev share. So a lot of these guys do affiliate marketing where they'll pay out 5% per sale. Mm -hmm. We can track uh, somebody coming in, responding to one of our ads, and transacting, we get 5% of that sale. We can also track if they saw an ad, maybe came back a week later, 30 days later, mm -hmm. and do some kind of rev share on that as well. So we're trying to kind of flesh out what the model will be, and maybe it'll just be a complete <coughs> software sale where it's you know $1,000 a month or $5,000 a month, which I think we're going to get to a point where it is something like that, and it'll be based on the amount of traffic they have coming in, because how big of a database do I need to manage, you know, from all these transactions and all these behavioral clicks that are coming through. I mean, that's how we did it at Red Eye, it was really the size of the database we had to manage. So right now it's still up in the air, we're, we're kind of interviewing clients and trying to figure it out and figure out what their appetite is for pricing. Uh, from an ETA point of view, how did, uh, what's it going to take cash-wise to okay. get to that first sale? Uh, so the first sale is... I don't need any cash for the first sale. Um, we have that kind of funded already. The development's just about done. What I just showed you, that quick little snapshot in the code, that'll be done mid-April. I have three or four clients, old clients, lined up, and I'm going to get the code on, probably just get it on their site and figure out some kind of pricing model for them. Once I have that done, and once I can prove the model and prove the lift, then I want to raise money, and then I want to really build this thing out and add many more triggers. I want to add a really, really slick interface for our clients to come in. Hopefully I can get to the point where a real law or a golf discount, Dell or anybody can come in there and they can just do it on their own. They can go in there, create their triggers, pull their code, slap it in. I'm going to work with a Telium, Bright Tag, uh, any tag management company, container uh, site, just get it into their platform so they can just pull it in. That's actually about all we have time for questions okay. today, so thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, we're going to hear from Contap. Kip Taylor is going to take the lead, joined by his new partner, Jason. Good evening. I'm Kip. I'm Jason. And we're here to tell you about a technology that's going to simplify the way people connect. So when Jason and I first met, the journey began with exchanging business cards, which I had to upload the phone number and email to my phone. And then I had to go through the lengthy process of logging onto Facebook and searching for Jason there, then logging onto LinkedIn searching for Jason again, doing the same thing on Twitter, Google+, Plus, Instagram. We thought there had to be a better way of doing this, and so we searched. But to our surprise, we didn't find anything. So being two entrepreneurs, we decided to build it. Oh, no worries. 
more anticipation. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice show up here. Contap lets you connect with every person on every platform in one app. So when Jason and I meet, we simply pull out our smartphones. There we go. <laughs> and, and once uh, we just tap down, and that actually establishes a connection right there. And from there, we let users choose what they want to share within the application. So for instance, with my friend Rebecca, I only want to share messaging, Facebook, and Twitter. So with one tap, she's now a contact in my phone book, and I can source all of her information in that one place. So in addition to it conveniently locating all that information right there, I can also message so I don't have to switch apps just to say hello. And I can add a quick note directly to her contact so I don't forget just why it was so important that I connected with her in the first place. So that's the tech. And I'm going to talk about the traction, the team, and the timeline. So we've been working really hard for the last six months to try to launch this venture. In fact, we've actually built and designed a fully functional iOS 7 application that will be available to download in the App Store shortly. Uh, we've built and launched our website. We personally have put $70,000 into this venture. We're building out our board of advisors. We've assembled a functional team and established a C Corp in Delaware. The functional team, Kip, myself, and our developer Evan have been working on this project for six months launching this app. And it's that type of camaraderie that we've been able to build that we're going to steamroll into the next venture, which is to launch the, to develop and launch the application on the Android operating platform. So in the next six months, here's what we're going to do. We're taking the next six weeks to design and develop the Android application. And then from there, we'll go into a beta test, a soft launch, and a hard launch. We're going to start at Babson and then the Boston community, and then go into launching uh, regionally. Here you can see our user base that we're hoping to get over the next six months. We're bootstrapping this quarter and next, and then once we get operational on two platforms, and operational on two platforms, uh, we'll hope to raise money in Q4. Exactly. And to be clear, we're not another social network. We're not an aggregator of social media. We are a tool that lets you simply and finally connect with people on every platform in any way that you choose. Thank you for your time, and look forward to your feedback. Questions from panelists? Yeah, I'd love to hear your thinking on your business model, you know, and with the 90% of iPhone mobile apps as a freemium strategy. Just what, what are you thinking on that, and how, how, that, how you get to really self-financed growth through cash flow, which is really the key uh, long-term for you? Absolutely. So traditionally, apps make money three ways. It's either you know, through selling the app for 99 cents or a dollar, through doing advertising on the app, or uh, through data, so selling that data to, to third parties. Um, we believe in this space, the most important thing is, of course, growth. So growth equals revenue in the long term, <coughs> equals profit in the long term, um, as I'm sure all of you all have seen recently. We don't want to do anything to hinder that growth, so we're going to be giving away the application for free. Uh, which, I mean, of course, a lot of apps have done successfully, and then be looking for an acquisition strategy in the long term, uh, given you know the number of users we have and the uh, type of data that we've collected. Should get the WhatsApp founders on board. <laughs> if, if you can put us in touch, that would be awesome. That's why we're here tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, so, and, and is the main idea that the way this works is through this, this tapping that, that you described before? <laughs> that's how it works, right? Absolutely. So you pull out your phone and just tap down, and someone does the same. Okay. So they both have to have, obviously, they both have to have your, your app. Yes. So, so how are you dealing with that from a distribution standpoint? Because obviously you need a critical mass of people in these areas to have the app in order for it to be useful for people. Exactly. So it's more important that we have, you know, 10,000 users in the Boston area than a million in the U.S. Uh, because, you know, we want people running into each other who have the application together. So we're going to be starting off with a growth strategy that, you know, is specific to geography. So we'll start, in, as he mentioned, with Babson, growing that out in that community, then moving into the larger Boston area. And once we're able to get some traction there, we'll begin identifying which cities that we want to move to next, probably somewhere within the Northeast. Because I think, to build on that, um, and I, I think the app is really, really cool. I mean, I would find a lot of value in that. My, my concern is, uh, 
along the same lines in terms of, remember Bump? Yes, Everybody had, and that just sort of, I thought it was the coolest thing when it came out and then it just sort of went away. So, so what are you guys thinking in terms of like building that critical mass pretty quickly? Absolutely. So, uh, well, the good thing about Bump, they actually sold in November for $32 million. And, and you have heard it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so, uh, to build that critical mass, um, kind of as, as we discussed, it's going to be important to, you know, in certain ge geographies. But we believe that each person, like, our only job is not to convince, you know, a million people to download the app. It's to create a product that's so good that one person will download it and they'll tell at least one friend. And we'll let it grow organically that way. So we're just focusing on developing the best product that we can and then getting as much awareness out there as possible. We're going to have uh, major ambassadors on, on huge college campuses across the country as well incentivized. Thank you very much, Captain Jason. Thank you. Our next one up, our next one, our next rocket pitch is by Jack Elbow and it's called Boat Air. Hello, my name is Jack Alba. On 9-11, I was sitting at my desk at Morgan Stanley on the 73rd floor of the South Tower when a plane hit the North Tower. I immediately started down the stairs and was stopped in my tracks by the voice of a fire marshal who said, our tower is completely secure. He left it open-ended that if I wanted to go back to my desk, that's okay. <coughs> Some instinct compelled me to run to the street and escape. I'm here today as a result of that decision. We all make decisions based on the information we, at hand. Each time we vote, we make decisions with limited and sometimes biased information. It's time for each of us to take back our own voice and make VoteAir the go-to resource to do that. VoteAir is educating and empowering voters to become better informed. Voter apathy is at its highest level in 50 years, with voter turnout dropping below 40% in midterm elections. Declining voter turnout is largely a result of a lack of trust in government, which has been declining steadily in the U.S. since 1958. It's time for us to reverse this trend. With the Voter App, anyone can create a personal profile in seconds matching voters' interests and issues to candidates' interests and issues. The VoteAir app will be a connection engine that biometrically matches a user's interest to a scorecard of candidates' and issues and makes recommendations <coughs> as if coming from a friend. After surveying over 1,000 people in face-to-face -face chats, 15% could be classified as early adopters people who really like the idea and will join the ranks right away. According to Ward Professor Jonah Berger, and I quote, word of mouth is a powerful tool and it's 10 times as effective as traditional advertising. As a result, VoteAir will target 9 million early adopters of the 87 million millennials in the U.S. VoteAir will generate its revenue primarily through online advertising. Big data for voters is quickly gaining traction. There are several new players like VC Back, iCitizen, New York City, New York based Policy Mike, and nonprofit organization iSideWith.com. Both Policy Mike and iSideWith have published that they have over 9 million users since inception. Netscape founder and venture capitalist Mark Andreessen recently tweeted, and I paraphrase, that the news industry will grow between 10 and 100 times over the next 20 years. I need you to help me and VoteAir to become the go-to resource for educating and empowering voters everywhere. Thank you very much, Jack. Questions from our panelists? Yeah, I have a question. So, um, are you familiar with a company called, that, well, what's called the Latinx? It's actually since, since more, um, which was, doing something somewhat similar, but one of the challenges that they ran into, I was curious how you're planning to address it, is just the cyclicality of, of elections, that you know, there's probably a lot of interest in this around the election season, sure. but then how do you sustain that right. during the non-election? Absolutely. So one of the ways that we're looking to do that is maybe through a Twitter feed. So we're going to give you a little bit more 
reason to come in, see what's going on, maybe talk to your influ other influencers or friends. Or so there are different ways to play that role throughout the the uh, off season, so to speak. Um, yeah, I would definitely second that. So that was my biggest concern: is is just how would you keep that up? Uh, you and I had a chance to talk before. I would really like to understand the business model, but just a comment, actually, and this is really for all the presenters. The way you started off your presentation was really, really solid. Um, it, it, we often say the best way to get an investor interested in what you're doing is tell a story, and you told a very, um, just a wonderful story, and then tied it to some hard stats, and uh, so far that's the best to sort of kick off to a presentation, and I commend you for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I'm intrigued by your biometric matching. Yes. Uh, and how that is that a proprietary system uh, process, or is that off the shelf? And what's the kind of gap to commercialization that right. you're looking at? Right. So there's a couple of things regarding that. It's not an off the shelf. It is a proprietary matrix, and it was being used for separate use. And we're just now, as we go through some funding, we're looking to basically customize it for this use. So you'll license that? Uh, there's what we could, it depends on how. We could go either way. If we can cut the right deal on the licensing side, that's one way to play it. Um, because we know how far it's come along, and now it depends on how fast we want to move with that. Or we can start to develop that uh, in-house as well. We've got time for one more question. Can we actually then, since we have just a moment of time, can we stick on the business model for just a moment? Sure. Because uh, I really would like to understand how you're seeing the potential monetization of how this, this actually will work. Right. So once once we get to some critical mass, there's two ways. A critical mass of users can be of interest through, you know, as a data mining company or as an analytics company. So those are two ways to, you know, that can be of interest to a third party. And um, the other way, of course, is through uh, online advertising, so we're definitely using that as a as a model as well. Great, thank you very much. And our next rocket pitch uh, will be about Sweet Roots, New York City. Marissa Smith. Hi, my name is Marissa Smith, and I'm the founder and CEO of Sweet Roots NYC. Statistically, about half of the people in this room are on a diet. One third of you have a food allergy or intolerance. Uh, uh, among you, there are vegetarians and vegans, and over the past few years, more and more of you have decided to go gluten-free or paleo. You get the picture. When it comes to deciding what's for dinner, one size does not fit all. Uh, and that's before you ever even set foot in a grocery store or schlep your groceries home on the subway or find a recipe online or cry while you chop the onions. <laughs> and, that, and that's just to get dinner on the table by 10 p.m., which is like the story of my life. Um, and I to remember to breathe when I do this. It's like a problem that I have. Um, I know a lot of my business, but I forget to breathe. Um, so if you have an app for that, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> Basically, what I want to say is that in a nation where two-thirds of the population is overweight and productivity is hampered by fatigue, diet-related fatigue and junk food is more convenient than fresh food, there has to be another way. Sweet Roots is a healthy meal delivery service that makes it easy to eat exactly the way you want without the hassle of planning, shopping, and chopping. We, do, we design customized menus for all of our clients, source top-notch organic ingredients, prep and portion all of them, and then deliver them right to your door, ready to cook, so that dinner can be on the table in less than 30 minutes. And all you need is olive oil, salt, and pepper. Um, we launched our business in 2012. Uh, we uh, left, sorry. We launched our business in 2012, and in our first year, uh, we launched in the second half of 2012, we earned uh, $53,000 with just 10 households. Um, in, our in our next year, in 2013, uh, we had $200,000 in sales and grew to 45 households. Thank you. Um, we built a team that's really amazing. We have an incredible chef whose background is in uh, the New York City's green markets. Our uh, operations manager has several decades of industrial kitchen experience. 
Um, and we have a client services team that really supports the customized menu planning part of our process. Um, we obviously have incredible traction. Uh, we've grown by 50% since the start of this year, so we're on track for $600,000 in sales. Um, but, uh, thank you, 30 seconds over here. Um, um, we have incredible traction, and we uh, have done a lot of work so I think we're ready to go even bigger. Um, there are other ready to go companies on the market that have already expanded nationally, but they're really focused on the value market, and we've placed ourselves in the premium space by focusing on customization, quality organic ingredients, nutritionally sound recipes, um, and really attentive, compassionate customer service. Um, we, our plan is to, we are seeking $500,000 in funding um, so that we can expand our market share in New York City through ramping up our referral program. Uh, we ramping up our referral program, um, we will be uh, launching a PR campaign and we will be using our existing celebrity clients to build out celebrity seating. We also plan to roll out our service in four additional metropolitan areas, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Boulder. Um, and we'll use the funding to build our infrastructure there and to um, promote our launches in those cities. Um, thank you for your time. Questions for Marissa? So far, what's keeping you up at night? Um, I think it's logistics. Um, I was going to say logistics. It's logistics. The, uh, the really scalable side of our business is technology based, and so the customized menu planning, we built a proprietary algorithm, which makes it really feasible for us to do at a huge scale. Um, the challenging piece of our business, honestly, is traffic. Um, so we have an advisor that's one of the logistics specialists at UPS who is guiding us as we think about expanding to other cities because we sort of have to model in New York. I, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up here and I was able to get lots of insight that way. Um, but moving to other cities, we really need some other kinds of insight. And so I think um, that's going to be one of the big challenges for us since we deliver rather than ship. is a choice to ensure quality of the product. <coughs> And can you talk a little more about the delivery process? Is it is it daily? Is it weekly? It's a weekly it? delivery process. Um, we basically had a, a science lab experiment where we tested ingredients to figure out how long ingredients last for different days. And so we structure our menu planning with that in mind. And so you'll eat your seafood at the beginning of the meet, and you eat seafood, and you'll have really hearty vegetables towards the end of the week. And so that's how we make it work. Um, most of our clients do somewhere between three and five days worth of food with us. Um, and so a once a week delivery system at this point is the thing that makes most sense given our scale. I'm curious what your long-term vision is for this. I think um, there's two portions to it. One of them is to really roll out the service. I get emails and Facebook messages from across the country from people saying like, you have no idea how hard it is for me to eat the way that I eat and do it in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I really wish that you would come here. So part of it is this um, really strong desire to bring what we do, which I think life-changing to other people. Um, and then I also think that there is a really powerful media component to what we're doing. We're learning a lot about the way people eat and a lot of the struggles that they have in terms of eating healthy on a daily basis. And I would love to take some of the things we're learning and make it more accessible to more of a population because obviously we have a white glove service. It's not something that everybody can afford. Um, and I think that education and media is a way that we'll be able to have a broader impact. Can I have one more Because yep. I just hired somebody to do this for me and my husband in our house. Um, so I'm very well after we're probably working. Right. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm just wondering if, you know, what, so where I can see a lot of money being made, if this is something that would be of interest to you, is to actually focus on, you said, you developed a proprietary application or algorithm. Mm -hmm. And if I knew that my person was actually like, sort of had the stamp of approval of your app, given that's what you know how to do, there could be a lot of money in that for you guys. If you just focused on that and then your media content and let other people actually cook the stuff and bring it. Sure, so I think that a lot of that comes down to like what kind of business I want to run. Right. And I'm sure, I'm sure that that will impact which kinds of investors will be interested in my business. I don't know that what I really want to run is a company. I think that the technology is really valuable and perhaps it will make sense to license it and spin it off some other way. Um, but in terms of who I am, like being connected to the people is really important to me. 
um, that's and having that kind that. of voice. And so yeah. um, I have gone back and forth about different paths for growing this business, and I think this is the one that's true to who I am, and I know that I have to be passionate to run this business, otherwise, like, I will not be willing to stay up at night thinking about the logistics involved in moving things around the DC area. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you very yeah. much. For One kind of food to another. Yeah. India in a box. Cheyenne, maybe you can introduce the rest of your team as well. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. Okay. India in a box. All right. Namaste and hello, everyone. We're Team India in a Box. I'm Sham. I'm Jashak. I'm Chiu. Um, so, in the words of George Bernard Shaw, there's no love sincerer than the love of food, and the three of us believe that too. Um, Indian food is world renowned and loved. Um, however, we want to bring to the market an Indian food meal that is both great taste, taste wise and can be prepared in under four minutes. So, what are we trying to do? You can prepare our product by simply pouring it in a pan, adding water, <coughs> heating it for four minutes, and there you have it, your meal is ready. So, according, for our value proposition, we feel that a lot of people are intimidated by Indian food by just knowing that it's too spicy, it's too hot, that's what everyone feels. And there's also that complication behind trying to prepare an entire meal. We're trying to overcome those. We'll have, our food will have little to no oil, it'll have no preservatives, it'll contain, it'll still retain most of its nutritional value. On the side of the taste, we make sure that we have food that has three different spice levels. So you know exactly what you're getting when you buy it. If you want no spice, there will be no spice. And it'll be, uh, the products will be from different areas of uh, India. So you have a wide, very product range. And at last, it'll be simple and easy to make. Um, so, um, what's the sort of market that we're looking at? The packaged food industry is a $95 billion industry uh, with profits about $2.3 billion. 37% of that industry is ethnic food. That's where we lie, with 40% of uh, gross margin making it pretty lucrative. Uh, our target customers are people who we're looking at are uh, 18 to 34 year old people in the urban area with low to medium uh, disposable income, who are time crunch, who uh, need a good meal quickly, also who are exposed to different kind of ethnic food. So we're looking at basically uh, Indian students and uh, working professionals who would be our core buyers. We're also looking at uh, people who love Indian food but don't have the expertise for it, or the expertise to cook it, or don't have really have the time to go out and consume it. In terms of our retail strategy, we're looking at two different ways to go about it. One is brick and mortar through, first and foremost through uh, retail, uh, Indian stores, uh, and second through normal grocery stores, also through an online model which would be um, basically yeah, either through Amazon or through our own website. So together we have 10 years of experience working in our respective family businesses, each of which are uh, multi-million dollar companies. And we've divided all our responsibilities depending on our expertise. So we, we think it will help develop and uh, promote our venture better. Uh, so we already uh, uh, had a lot of tasting sessions back in Babson and a lot of focus groups and we got a lot of uh, positive feedback from that. And we plan to launch India in a Box by the fall. So we plan, we are, we'd love to connect with uh, people in the industry and uh, gain their guidance and move forward. Thank you, we are India in a Box. Well, my well, no, my my my. That's not really a question. It's a wish that that like perhaps some people even brought some of your Indian food. <laughs> 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 as soon as they put that up, we have it. But we were like, we should have got way more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what, what are your, like a year from the fall, what, what is your goal, where do you want to be? So the way we're looking about it, I think it's common to all, most of the small business. We're trying to think about first trying it in the Boston area um, in two folds. Try, try universities where we know students would need it. And try urban people or business people who 
who don't have the time to do it and love Indian food. So roll it out in Boston, use that understanding of it. And as you said, one year down the line, we'd want traction. We, we, the way we're trying to do it is go online and sell it, but also try Indian grocery stores. We have we spoken to them. They're, so they're, uh, they're open to the idea. And that's what we wanted to do first, start, start out that way. So it'd be better there like a sales goal or that you're trying to? There is. We, I, I believe $100,000 would, would be a good start, the way we're looking at it. But I think once we're three months into the market, we, we'd have a much better understanding of it. Is that 100000 on sales or you're looking at? On sales. Uh, okay, so, uh, and maybe I missed that part, I apologize. Did you talk about how much money you're trying to raise or are you trying to raise money? Um, so we, we believe that at the first stage we can self-fund the project. What we would really need is um, we've been speaking to people and the operation side, the distribution side is really key over here. Because you're going into an almost commoditized market, you're, you're trying to differentiate yourself there. And so we want, we want an expertise in the food market is where we need the help. With someone who's been in the industry, knows how to do that, how to do that. And the, the way we believe we can get people on board is by first proving our model, by actually starting selling it, showing the proof of concept that people want to want to buy the food, they love the food, and then then open it up to other people yes. to invest. We also want to get in touch with our food brokers who can get us in touch with uh, different retail partners. I mean, that's definitely another thing. That we can. Uh, sure. uh, clarifying point, your family businesses that you listed, are they in the food industry themselves? Um, no, uh, it's a simple answer, but they're in the retail industry, so that way we have an understanding of how the retail part of it works, but no, no food industry. Who, who is, who is the, your, your real competitor in this space? So we do have a couple of competitors uh, from back home, but our process is completely different from how they go about uh, making it. We have a, re, uh, a dehydrated process which completely changes the way uh, it has to be made as well as how uh, the amount of nutrients that are retained and that's going to be one of our uh, educating factors to our buyers when we're going to be promoting the brand as well as when we're packaging it. It's going to be promoting a more healthier concept than any other uh, sort of Indian uh, packaged food industry, uh, sort of competitors that we have out there. Is, is your process licensed or you made it up? <laughs> No, it, it, it's, it, it's a common uh, process, to be very honest. It's, it's dehydration. You see, it's dehydrating a meal and pack, packaging it. So it's it's, uh, it's very common. So it's on the shelf. It's low, low cost. Yes. And we'll have a chance for questions at the end as well. Thank you very much, India. Thank you. Thank you. And then we're going to hear from another current MBA student in a minute. This is Andreas Valencia with GoBag. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so thanks to the single-use plastic bottles like this, we are able to hydrate, uh, hydrate more often. However, they consume a lot of energy, and only 20% of them, of them can be recycled. Therefore, 80% end up in landfills. And that, uh, that's the reason why in San Francisco, they just ban the distribution of uh, uh, bottled water. Solution is just the uh, bulky and rigid containers that you all have uh, deal with. They're very annoying, aren't they? So we have a, very, a better alternative for that. It's called the Go Bag. Go Bag is simply an ultra lean, ultra thin water container that can be folded flat and rolled in order to fit any pocket, backpack, or purse. Go Bag it can be washed and reused. Therefore, it contributes to uh, reduce the waste of these uh, containers. There are some competitors in the market, uh, but they're rather boring and rigid, and they're targeting the same sports outdoorsy people. We find that this is a canvas. For, the, for us, this is all design. That's why we're leveraging our brand in awesome graphics and cool design. So the market. In the US, Americans consume around 9 billion gallons of water a year. That means $11 billion expenditure, which translates to almost 200 bottles per person a year. For them, we have our awesome go bag with the accessories that come with it, that is the caps, the car binders, and the go sack, which is a pouch to keep it cooler for longer. And then we're also targeting the uh, promotional product market. That's a market of around $19 billion. And there, we are targeting the small businesses, which uh, can have our own designs with the logo on it. Uh, here's actual prototypes of our next run uh, with logos on them. And for the large businesses, uh, for them, we can have a, their own customized bottles with their own designs, even their share. Their shape. 
Um, so far, we have already sold uh, 1,100 bottles. It says only 500 because last week we sold 600 to the Basel Latin American Forum. Uh, uh, and the first hundred was in the first market that we conducted, uh, 170 in our first design fair. Um, there's also missing 80 units that we sold to the first retailer in Colombia. Uh, two weeks after they, first, uh, they, they placed the first order, they were asking for more. Um, and that's our sales so far. So what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, getting inside the US market. So we're uh, looking for sales and distribution contacts, retailers, corporate customers who want their logo on our bottles, uh, and some um, um, advice on how to move forward with the design as, uh, and suppliers in the US to compare the cost of producing in Colombia or here. Finally, I invite you to visit our webpage, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Uh, just, uh, so how much do they cost and how long does the go bag last? How many uses can you get out of it? Okay, so they retail it for $9. Um, I had one for six months almost and I lost it. So <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it was very good. And no, no worry that there's, like, it's going to get contaminated or... Well, you can wash it, you can put water in, it doesn't get any smell so far. I mean, in the six months I had it, it never smelled like anything and I wash it. Uh, can, can you talk about, so are, are you man manufacturing these or are you, you know, get, or is it, is it just the designs that's kind of your, what's unique about them? How are, how are you? We source them. Um, we do all the design, the uh, shape, the graphic design, and we source them with a producer of this kind of packaging back in Colombia. Uh, but basically, uh, we work on all their design and the brand. Yeah, uh, I'm tipping point. View. How, how does this become contagious? Like, have, have you thought about and how are you going to approach it? You know, the connectors, maybe the salespeople. Who, 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 who are you trying to get this to that would kind of really make it ratchet? Well, this is the point in where we are. Uh, that those uh, uh, 15, uh, 1100 units without any sales team so far. So we were thinking about an agent or somebody who can uh, get us to the retailers or actually to the uh, to the corporate customers. Uh, the contact with the, the 600 units for the Basel Latin American Forum was only me. Uh, so probably we're, need, we're looking forward to, to uh, hire somebody who helps, up, uh, helps us with the sales um, of the bottles. Uh, that's the first approach we have. Other questions? What's, what's the closest other solution out there? I mean, I've seen a lot of water solutions at REI and places like that. What's the closest to what you have? There's a uh, countback. Right, okay. There's Vapor, which is uh, two of the bottles that I already uh, showed at the beginning, and uh, Stephen Graff, those are the two main competitors. Okay, and yours is better because? We are we are not targeting the sports people or the outdoorsy people. For us, this is just the cool one uh, with uh, awesome design. And it's for, for just the guys who are in the university and want to take water with them, and they just want to replace the bulky water, uh, the bulky container they have already. So for the coolest one that they can just put in the pockets and take it from everywhere. I think you though, just, you, just mentioned, you just mentioned your market though, you said you're yeah. targeting universities, not necessarily, I mean. This, this is one of the first ideas we, we have coming about, because uh, about some, uh, as the next run is about putting logos on, one of the next plans is to try to put it at uh, uh bookstore. So that's, that's the first approach. Good luck with that. Thank you very much. Coffee to another kind of drink. <laughs> so his favorite. Dan Qualls with drink crate. Dan's all you are. I brought a prop in the back. Uh, all right. So when uh, people come to my house, that around yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 street gardens in the back. Um, when people come to my house and bring a bottle of wine. They often confess I bought it because of the label. And they say it with a bit of embarrassment. But they shouldn't be embarrassed. We all buy wine because of the label. I'm a certified sommelier who travels the world to taste wine, and I still buy wine because of the label. Uh, the label says so much about the person who bought it, uh, what they want to get from it. Uh, beauty of design is really the beginning of the experience. Uh, branding is important, we all know that. Uh, what's surprising is just how bad or boring most labels are. Wine shops are awash with weak brands. The number one rule of wine label design is often just don't offend. If you look at the two bottles on the left, take away the name, I have no idea who that is. There are thousands of bottles of the black eye picture of a house. 
A few brands uh, break the mold, and success often follows soon after. Uh, Yellowtail, uh, they capture a huge share of the $34 billion Americans spend on wine each year because their labels are fun, and they're simple, and they're compelling. Um, every year, large companies buy small, successful, growing brands from smaller companies. The, the, the value of these acquisitions are never made public, but it's widely believed that when Jim Beam bought the Skinny Girl brand of wine and spirits, they did so for uh, $100 million. And what is Skinny Girl? Is it a plot of carefully cultivated vines in Napa Valley, or a passionate winemaker? No, it's a genius brand that creates instant emotional and aspirational connections. So Molly Duker uh, is a company that gets it. They get the importance of branding. Uh, they're widely distributed, uh, rapidly growing, very popular, and they charge a premium. Their cheapest one is $25. <coughs> and they can do that because people love their brands. They see the bottle and instantly want to buy it, even though that's 70, that's 25. They still buy it. Um, so how can we create another a Molly Duker? by following the lead of Threadless.com. Threadless has created a site where uh, designers, people who love creative design, uh, can participate in weekly contests to create t-shirts. Um, so they hardly ever produce a dud because the crowd helps craft and edit design and the crowd votes on their favorites. Oh, so they never produce failures. People like t-shirts, but they love alcohol. Uh, so enter uh, drinkcrate.com, which is be the first of its kind to rally community contributors around creative design and alcohol. I will hold a monthly contest to craft a lovable, um, compelling brand, turn that winner into an actual bottle of alcohol, wine, beer, spirits, and sell it online. Uh, if we take the winner, uh, what, something that sells well online, we can then push through traditional retail channels. And if a wine sells well in those retail channels, sell the brand itself to Constellation or some other big company. The founding team includes me, Amit Bansel, a Y Combinator alum and front-end developer, and Vladimir Grinkoff, the back-end developer. We're currently looking for advisors who may someday want to become investors as well. All right, thank you. And uh, this is a boring label, by the way. So <laughs> that's why you need to create. Done. <laughs> Questions? Mike, can you lead off? Yeah, uh, great reference to Threadless. marketing budget that's driven by the community, yeah. 500,000. Uh, I'm just curious, are you ready to be a community leader and server? You know, because that, 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 that's a really key part of their ethos, and I, you know, that's, that's going to be your yeah. business, really, yeah. as opposed to labels, you know, right. in a sense. Uh, I so totally agree. What, what, what values drive you for that, creating a whole new community? Uh, it's really just about knowing what people like. They like building things. They like having being a part of something, being a part of community. Um, don't put profits first, but definitely share the profits with the designers. So it's not just you get a cash prize, congratulations. No, you get a cash prize and a percentage of sales going forward. Um, the key is to make it collaborative, so it's not competing one against the other. It's we're gonna help each other out. And I don't win this month, but next month maybe I will. So they're all on the same team. Um, we, all, we all win if somebody wins. That's the idea. Um. If I, if I caught it correctly, I, I, I'm impressed at it. You said one of your fan, one of your co-founders, I think you said his name was Drinkoff. Is that right? Yeah. My company has only Drinkoff. Oh, Drinkoff. Oh, Drinkoff. Oh, Drinkoff. Oh, Drinkoff. Drink oh, Drink yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, so can you talk a little bit about so that actual? It sounds like what you're doing is I mean you're having people design the labels, but you're actually. Are you just sourcing the wine from different different wine yeah. The bulk market is huge. Thirty of the top thirty wine brands in the U.S. are virtual brands. Treasury Wine Estates they own eighty-seven brands. Twenty of them have a brick-and-mortar winery. The other sixty-seven are a label. They exist on the store shelf. They exist on the website, and that's it. Um, the virtual uh, the bulk wine business is huge. Less so with beer and spirits. Uh, I think oftentimes with this site it will be more about building a brand for a craft brewery, a craft distillery, and just like, here's your label. Uh, wine, I know that business very well, and there's huge bulk wine market. You can get a lot of it sometimes. Of, we have some great juice coming in from Italy or South America, Napa Valley, and you can get it at a good rate. And then really it's just about branding. Um, there are dozens of wines, several wines at least. You can go to any store in town, it's the exact same wine in multiple bottles at the cheap price points it is. Yeah. How are you actually going to handle, I can see how you've got this built-in audience of people who are going to buy the wines, which is really cool. Yeah. 
Um, but how do you actually get the wine into the liquor stores? I mean, is, is that a process you already have in place, or is that something you've got to overcome? It's not. Um, okay. I understand the business of selling wine online back to consumer pretty well. Last year, uh, wine sales increased in retail 7%, increased direct consumer over their net 13%. I understand the business pretty well. Actually putting it through distributors and retailers, not as uh, familiar with, but I have another company that works directly with retailers, does wine marketing for retail shops. Um, so as I talk to those owners of liquor stores, I'll get to know the process better. And uh, there are several distributors in town in Boston who are pretty innovative and I'm, uh, have contacts. So I'm learning about that, basically. Well, you should talk to Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm sure you know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Can you introduce me to Charles? Happy to. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we have a Baptist student, Georgia Beatty, running Beatty Wines in Australia. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, thank right. you very much. And next up, we're going to hear about Outdoor Promise from Ronald Zarilla. Hello, everybody. I'm Ronald Zarilla, founder and president of the Outdoor Promise. Uh, it's a nonprofit. And um, when I was uh, 14 years old, I was just like a lot of New York City kids today who don't spend any time outdoors or not, not much at all. Uh, that all changed when the New York City Hall of Science sent me to an away camp in the Catskills. And there, there I realized how important it was to spend time outdoors. Um, the Outdoor Promise, our goal is to incorporate STEM concepts with outdoor education in an effort that makes fun and exploration and discovery. Um, we're looking to target New York City youth that are, are in between K, sorry, are between are attending kindergarten through high school. And we feel bringing that classroom outdoors will be a lot more engaging than just memorizing things like they're doing today. So, and our nation has fallen behind in STEM education. Uh, also, research has shown that there are many problems that the youth are, fa youth are facing today, like obesity, ADHD, urban stresses, that are manageable, even preventable, with some time spent outdoors. So we built a coalition of partners that are going to help us achieve our mission. Uh, We've partnered up with the Appalachian Mountain Club and their Youth Opportunities Program, and they're going to provide our staff with leadership training and all the gear we need from wool socks to tents. Uh, the Sierra Club Inner City Outings Program are going, to, are going to provide us with leaders, and they're also going to help keep our expenses low by covering our trips under the Sierra Club insurance umbrella. Uh, Gateway National Park is going to be a good place to lead some of our programs. They're an essential partner. We're going to earn revenues by getting contracts with the New York City Department of Education. Um, our programs are going to be aligned with the Common Core Curriculum and New York State Learning Standards. And, and we're also going to offer outdoor programs to youth groups and religious, to youth development organizations and religious, religious groups for a fee. We're going to offer scholarships for any kid that decides to follow STEM related fields in the future. We're also going to offer grants for, for youth leaders trying to take their youth outdoors. So our, our management team consists of a seasoned nonprofit veteran with over three decades of experience in social enterprise. Uh, another one of our board members is a New York City park ranger, and he's studying biology in Queens College. Uh, I'm studying finance in Baruch. I'm an avid outdoorsman, and I'm looking to turn my passion into a business. We're asking for $35,000 to take 200 New York City youth outdoors this summer and provide 15 grants for other youth leaders to take their youth. Um, when, to conclude, I want to leave you guys with one final thought. 80% of the future careers in our country are STEM related, so let's get our future leaders prepared for tomorrow and let's go outdoors. Thank you. So who is actually going to be leading the, or delivering the education? Is it, is it teachers at the individual schools, or is that something you're... We're going to provide the leaders. Okay. Yeah, so we're going, to, we're going to be leading there. The teachers are, are they're, they're going to have to have chap chaperones for safety reasons. So, so teachers will be part of the program, but we're going to be leading the groups. Okay. 
And are these just daily things, or is it, or is it a weekly? Is it a whole week? Well, we have different programs. One of them is going to be a six-session program with the Department of Ed, which will which will be aligned, well, which will fit in with their curriculum, and it'll be customizable, so they decide what they want to teach depending on what they're covering. And the other programs will be adventure programs, which will will focus on STEM also, but also provide a teamwork component and engage the youth that way. And those will be just one day hike or an overnight, whether camping or on in a cabin. I, I've never actually seen the combination of these two. I mean, you have all the outdoor stuff and then STEM, of course. But is there anyone else doing anything like this out there that you're aware of? Yeah, well, I, I was supposed to say that in my pitch, but I was nervous. But. <laughs> <laughs> they cover outdoors and outward bound. They offer yeah. outdoor experiences, but right. they don't really combine STEM. And I feel that that's a huge market opportunity. Um, Washington is focusing on that. Our country is lacking STEM education. So I, I feel like it's a good fit. And there's so many, so many ways you could mix the outdoors with STEM education, from GPS, coordinates and a map, using math engineering, building things, bridges, just outdoors is the perfect place to teach these things and not just in a classroom with a chalkboard. One, one quick idea for you. If you um, make sort of a, so it's for boys and girls I imagine, which is fantastic, but if you actually focus a girls thing, I mean this, and have um, you know a woman as a partner and, and really focus on girls and STEM and outdoor, that is like close your eyes easily fundable. So it would be fantastic. It's important for boys and girls, but if you do something just around the girls with this, that's huge. Yeah, you're the second person that told me that. There you go. <laughs> I have one more question. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna, I have to excuse myself. Ronald was a student of mine uh, at the college about two years ago. And uh, he, you know, I just give him a lot of credit and you know, praise for sticking with his idea while he's going to school, building this, this organization where he built that. Those are real partnerships. They actually do exist uh, on, on, on his slide. They're not you know, aspirational. So um, you know, there's, a, there's over a million, million students in uh, the New York City public schools that probably never, never really spent more than an hour or two in the woods. Ever. You're going to recuse yourself because you're going to do a one minute take that. <laughs> to our last presentation, but certainly not our, our least presentation, uh, a recent graduate from Babson College, Russell Brathwaite. Russ, it's all yours. My name is Lyndon Braithwaite. This is my son, Russell Braithwaite, a graduate of Babson. And uh, we started this foundation here, this uh, corporation actually, um, this company uh, in 2011, uh, November to be exact. Joe to Russ. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, basically, we uh, we started BOE Inc. off of you know just experience and life. Um, gonna tell a story. In 2011, my dad took my little brother to a formerly known as New Jersey Nets game, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were walking in the stands with their concession food, and they also saw a woman with her son on her waist and her other son walking, but she was also carrying nachos, popcorn, <laughs> and drinks. Um, sad to say, she ended up dropping that food. <laughs> very, very upsetting to see $20, $30 worth of concession food just go to waste. But my company, BOE Inc., we've developed an idea, a product that will solve all of that. This is what we call peace of mind. Basically, it gives you a peace of mind when you're carrying your food around. Um, if you can hold it with one hand, you can hold the whole meal and on the back side you can put dry food and on the front side you can hold a fountain drink. You can hold it from the front, the side, and the bottom. It's real, it's real easy to carry. Um, for us, it's been one journey that's taken us so far. Um, right now we are working on fulfilling orders. We've, read, we've been to several, several vendors, uh, small burger joints around the neighborhoods of Brooklyn and Long Island. We've uh, visited Shake Shack out here in Manhattan. We've had year-long conversations about putting this inside of their businesses. Not only does Peace of Mind help you with carrying food in a concession or a movie setting, but you can also use it for marketing. So as you can see on the device that my dad's holding, we have Regal Cinemas. How awesome would this be inside of the movies, you know, instead of holding a large popcorn and a large drink in one hand, and then your phone rings because your friend's trying to find you in the movie theater. 
you can have peace of mind now when you have your whole meal in your hand. <laughs> Drink and popcorn. It's, it's, it's really simple. Trust me, it really is. Um, we've done several focus groups with small, small niches, uh, you know, kids, uh, families, and things we've heard. It's really easy to use. I would love this at a sporting event. Wow, this is simple and convenient. It speaks for itself, people. Um, as you can see here, we've taken a lot of photos. We've been out, we've been out there in the public, and we've let people use it. We've let people play with it, and they're like, "Wow, Shake Shack doesn't have this." No, it's brand new to market, and we're really focused on pushing this forward. <laughs> this summer, we have a plan to actually get this out to about ten or more vendors. Uh, whether it be a small burger joint like Shake Shack, we're trying to close that deal. We just closed the deal with a place called NA Bagels in Brooklyn, New York. They fulfilled an order of about 4,000, and we're also working with a pretzel shop in uh, Long Island Mall called uh, the, Do The Twist. Correct, yeah, Do The Twist. And they want to fulfill a very large order. Um, what we're looking for today, uh, more connections for arenas, sporting, uh, sporting events, colleges, uh, movie theaters, and uh, investors. Well, if we were to get an investment, we'd take $100,000 for 25% stake, and we would use that to uh, fulfill our first orders, which are very, very expensive due to the fact that the company that we work with right now is uh, actually making this stuff for us um, in their current factory, but they'd have to make the, the plates to help cut the, the mold in the template for our product, peace of mind. <coughs> Thank you, and we appreciate your feedback. <laughs> Questions? Uh, so I love the idea. This is super cool. I think you should like pitch it to Mark Cuban. I think so. <laughs> you know, I'd love to hear what he has to say about this. Um, but one thing, when you did ask for the hundred thousand and twenty-five percent, so you're valuing at four hundred thousand dollars. That seems like a pretty hefty price for where you're at right now. So can you take me through that? Uh, well, basically, um, that would go a lot towards manufacturing. Um, the manufacturer we're working right now wants to make a template for us, but they want to see the commitment, and they want to see orders fulfilled. So to make that template and have that machine actually set aside for us, the gluing, the folding, and the work is to actually work on this project, it'd take about maybe $200,000 for them to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the money would be used uh, to fulfill orders for piloting programs. Um, so just, you know, get out there and actually give this product for free, just to, so some places can actually, you know, talk about it. We want to eventually get to food trucks. We want a lot of places to start seeing this and then get big orders placed because our manufacturer wants millions to be produced. They don't want just thousands. Any questions? Um, well, one, one comment on the question. Um, just at the beginning, you made the comment about you know, going last and compliance is a bad thing. It's actually, for all these, these pitch competitions, going last is actually a good thing. Good, good, um, good. Because there's that kind of recency effect when everybody finishes, so you shouldn't feel upset about it. Happy. <laughs> um, the, uh, the question I have is, so is there anything, I, I don't know if you, if there's anything patentable about this, this or is it, you know, how do you, how do you, deal with just the concern that obviously they're big players in the space, so that no, that's not a great question. Off. We actually do have a design patent on it. Um, it's in the office. We have it um, one of a kind of its own. Never seen before, never done. C certain things have had the same function, but not this exact design. And the, des the design patent is actually owned by you? Yes, BEO Inc. Yes. I'm curious what your backgrounds are. My, my first company I built, I actually did it with my father, which was super cool. So it's so neat to see this. Um, what, what is your background? Um, I'm a Babson 2013 alum. I studied marketing and entrepreneurship. I had the great pleasure of having Leonard Green as one of my professors. That makes some sense. Uh, that's very deep success. There you go. Right there. <laughs> my background is a former uh, national soccer player of Guyana, South oh, America. Yeah. Super cool. That's the stadium. <laughs> hey, so why I mentioned Mark Cuban, but I, I was doing that half jokingly. So have you thought about pitching this to him? No, actually, we are we're in the process of filling our application for Shark Tank. Uh, they have changed their application process, so it's uh, very more tedious. A lot more information is needed. Uh, they're looking for a lot of financials and you know hard information. Well, do you want to go directly? Just... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any kind of social? Um, Aspect of the business, are you going to locate the, your business, maybe manufacturer in certain communities? Uh, what type of you know, give, give back or social uh, contribution do you expect to 
create? Uh, well, uh, for the kids, primarily, I want to start with the kids in that uh, athletic setting where they play soccer, volleyball, you know, football setting, so they can be attached to the product, showing the rest of the nation and the world that how handy this product is, and if we give even a small kid peace of mind to just run and play, get, come back and just grab his or hers, as opposed to getting mixed up with whomever it was before. In, in addition to that, um, we know that New York State and a lot of surrounding states are getting rid of styrofoam. It's bad for the environment and it's really outdated, not good for us to even consume our food out of styrofoam. So we feel like this would be a great, you know, addition and get rid of that styrofoam, you know, to, uh, to help out, you know, the world. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, in general, okay, uh, just, just a couple of quick comments, okay? Having started 12 companies, okay, three of them were great successes, but the other nine of them, believe it or not, are only failures if you didn't learn something from it. So this is a great opportunity, even if you don't win, to learn something from it, okay? Number one, okay, you've got to have an idea when you say, I want X amount of dollars. You've got to have an idea of how much you're going to give up and some rationale for why you want that much. The fact that you need it to get going, it's a great thought, but it's not rational. The rational is valuation of, I want it because if I get it, my sales are gonna be X, profits are gonna be Y, the multiple is Z, and therefore the investor is gonna make a lot of money joining me. That's the kind of thing. The, the other thing I, that I raised my hand before as, as far as go back was concerned it was very interesting. I was down at the Blank Center and they were presenting go back, okay? And Annette came over and said, if you wanted to be quiet, you gotta buy about 10 bags. So I did, you just get the hell out of there kind of thing. But the interesting thing was I actually gave these to, to friends and I actually wrote my name on it and I was running one day and, and I lost it, okay? And, and I got a call. And they said, we see your name on it, okay? I said, great, can I get it back? He says, no, we want to know how we can get some, because it's so good. It's really a very, a very durable kind of product, and with the right kind of advertising on it, you guys could make some money. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> well, you uh, certainly heard a lot of very interesting presentations, and uh, I put my glasses on because I wasn't sure I could read this all right. Uh, first of all, I want to make a point of uh, focusing in on our sponsors for this evening. The Green Group certainly is a, a wonderful sponsor for us, and they are giving one hour of complimentary accounting consultations to each of the award winners tonight. There are going to be six award winners, as well as, uh, again, the, the recognition awards that are here. And then the uh, Samuel Goldstein and Company with one year of complimentary accounting consulting for all of the presenters. So all of you are winners just by making it here. And then uh, the video marketing group, we're doing all of the uh, video for us tonight. Again, all of these sponsors are, are critical and we certainly are very appreciative to all of you for what you've done and uh, encourage all of you to explore further and uh, working with the sponsors. Now, I do have an a, uh, envelope here that is for each and every one of the presenters, but I'm going to first and foremost focus in on the award winners. You know, the old envelope, please, while well, I was handed the envelope. Uh, no one knows the contents of this envelope. Uh, I don't even know the contents. So here we are. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the, uh, the award-winning teams to come up. We'll do a, a, a group photo at the end of uh, all of those that are... Uh, are recognized here. First in the most creative, we have BEOE. In the, uh, you can stay up here, we're going to do a photo after, like that's what I'm told, so hang, hang tough here. In the uh, most innovative area, we have Drink Crate. For most eco-friendly, who else? Go back, baby. 
Thank you all.